Welcome everyone. My name is Jonathan Whitmer Rich. I'm a, a Associate Dean for Academic Enrichment and Professor here at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Cleveland State University. I'm delighted to um, have you all be able to join us today. It looks like we have more than 50 uh, participants already and folks are still joining. Um, uh, I'm really delighted to um, introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Milan Asterio, uh, who is the Charles R. Emmerich Jr. Calfee Halter and Griswold Professor of Law here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Cleveland State University, to discuss the role of international law in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, as many of you know, Professor Stereo is an internationally recognized expert in uh, international law, international criminal law, human rights and, transition, and transitional justice. Um, she is the author of seven books and many law review articles on various topics of international law. And she uh, was a Fulbright scholar in 2013 in Azerbaijan, a former Soviet Republic, where she researched issues of state sovereignty and self-determination. So it's hard to imagine a better um, expert um, for us to have today to weigh in on uh, important questions of international law and the um, Russia-Ukraine conflict. So um, we will have time, I think, at the end for questions and answers. You're welcome, uh, because we're doing it in a webinar format. Uh, you won't be able to speak, but you can submit your questions um, in the Q&A. You're welcome to do that as, um, as the talk proceeds or at the end. Uh, we may hold questions till the end, but we'll just see how it goes. Um, so with no further ado, uh, Professor Stereo, take it away. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the very kind introduction. Um, as Jonathan, uh, Associate Dean Whitmer Rich mentioned, if you have questions, please send them through the uh, Q&A feature on this webinar format. You don't have to wait until the end to send your questions. Please start sending them as I speak, and I will do my best to stop um, in about you know, 20, 25 minutes and take all your questions and make this as interactive as possible. So today I wanted to just briefly touch upon some of the main international law issues in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. As we all know, Russia a few days ago has attacked Ukraine. President Putin, Russian President Putin has claimed in one of his public speeches that he wants to demilitarize and also denazify Ukraine. That is part of the justification that he is offered right now. Um, another justification that he has offered is that he is trying to help the two separatist regions, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, um, because there are many Russian, ethnic Russians who live in these regions. And he has made these claims of self-determination for these regions. And I'll come to this a little bit later in this talk. And as most of our audience members, I believe already know, Russia had already attacked Ukraine and occupied the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. And Russia has also backed these two separatist regions, the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions, starting from 2014. As a result of that, there were two protocols that were negotiated, the so-called Minsk protocols, back in 2014 and 2015. These protocols were negotiated between Russia, Ukraine, leaders of these two separatist regions, the Donetsk and the Luhansk, under the auspices of the so-called Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And these protocols clearly establish Ukrainian territorial sovereignty over these regions, but they provide for a ceasefire, and then they also provide for autonomy for these two regions. And the reason I mention that is that President Putin has also claimed in some of his recent speeches that these agreements have basically been abandoned, that these are no longer valid. That is, and, and part of that is because he's, he has basically blamed Ukraine and said that Ukraine has failed to implement these autonomy provisions provided for in the agreement. That is both factually and legally incorrect. It's factually incorrect because Ukraine actually has implemented some of these provisions. And it's also legally incorrect because in international law, the lack of implementation of an international agreement is not a valid ground to claim that the agreement itself is invalid. And the reason I mention this is just because this is part of Putin's justification for the attacks on Ukraine. The other reason uh, for the attacks is that Putin has basically already claimed how NATO countries have been expanding to the east against this agreement that was made in the early 90s that NATO countries would not expand to the east. Um, NATO, which is um, a mutual defense treaty, mutual defense organization, 
by now has expanded to the east. So countries such as, for example, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, the three Baltic states, but also some former um, Soviet influence states such as Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, the Czech Republic have become members of NATO. Putin basically drew a red line in terms of Ukraine joining NATO. Ukraine has never joined NATO, but there have there had been talks about Ukraine joining NATO, and Putin basically drew a red line and said basically, no, this is not acceptable to me. Now, what are some major international law issues related to this conflict? The first and probably most fundamental issue is use of force under international law. Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter clearly states that all members shall refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any states. So this prohibition on the use of force is enshrined in the United Nations Charter, which is a major treaty binding on all states that are members of the United Nations, which is basically all states on our planet. This prohibition on the use of force is also part of customary norm and customary norms of international law are binding on all states. And moreover, and perhaps most importantly, this norm is now, by now, uh, the, a so-called use Kogan's norm. Use Kogan's norms, norms are norms that are part of customary norm, customary international law, but norms that are so sacred, so important that no states may ever derogate from them. And it, it, so it's cr crystal clear in international law that states may not use force against each other. Now, there are two major exceptions to this rule. The first major exception is that force can be used against states if this is authorized by the United Nations Security Council. The problem in this instance is that there are five permanent members of the Security Council, and these include the United States, Russia, the UK, France, and China. These five permanent members of the Security Council have veto power over any resolution of the Security Council. And so if the Security Council attempted to pass a resolution which would authorize a collective use of force against Russia, Russia would surely veto that resolution. So in this particular instance, it is impossible that the Security Council will ever authorize the use of force against Russia. The other exception to international law, law's general prohibition of the use of force is self-defense. So in this instance, for example, Ukraine can use force against Russia in self-defense without violating international law. Self-defense also works in a collective model. So Ukraine could ask another state to join Ukraine in self-defense, collective self-defense against Russia. And that third state would not be violating international law if it joined forces with Ukraine defensively. The prospect of that as of now seem very slim, simply because Russia is such a major military and political power that not many states are willing to essentially go to war against Russia to help Ukraine. Those are the two legitimate recognized exceptions to the use to this prohibition of the use of force under international law. Now there are two other um, issues that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is, well, what about a collective use of force against Russia by another organization such as, for example, NATO. We already mentioned NATO earlier. NATO is a mutual defense um, alliance. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, as I already mentioned. And so an attack of Ukraine does not necessarily trigger the other member states' obligation to come to Ukraine's defense. But we already do have precedent where NATO countries have used force to essentially militarily intervene on the territory of a, of a NATO non-member state. And here, what I have in mind are the 1999 airstrikes against the territory of the then Federal Republic of Yugoslavia to force the then president Slobodan Milosevic to halt violating human rights in Kosovo. At the time there was a conflict in Kosovo and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia's president was accused and, and you know this has been factually proven that his forces were committing human rights violations in Kosovo. So NATO countries launched a series of airstrikes over a period of about three months in the spring of 1999. So we have precedent for the use of force by NATO on the territory of non-member states. The problem with this in this particular instance is twofold. One, 
The same is with the self-defense, collect the possibility of self-defense. NATO countries as of now are more reluctant to use military force against Russia, which is a major superpower. So I'm not sure as of today that NATO countries will actually agree to use military force on the territory of Ukraine because this would be interpreted as, as essentially an act of war by Russia. Two, the other problem with this is that this type of use of force, if not authorized by the Security Council, remains illegal under international law. And so although at the time of the 1999 airstrikes, there were scholars who wrote about this and said how the NATO intervention in the former Yugoslavia was morally correct, justified, legitimate, the fact remains that within the traditional international law system, this type of use of force, if unauthorized by the Security Council, remains illegal. And then last, what I wanted to mention is the use of force um, for the purposes of a humanitarian intervention. There are a number of scholars who have advanced this argument that the use of force against a sovereign state to essentially alleviate humanitarian suffering in the form of a humanitarian intervention is legal or is an emerging norm of international law. I don't have time to go into, de to, into details of this right now, but what I would argue is that at best, humanitarian intervention is an emerging norm of international law that is not a crystallized norm of international law, and that in the current context, it also remains unlikely that other states as of now are going to be willing to use force in Ukraine against Russia, even if it's for the purposes of a humanitarian intervention. The next issue that I wanted to just briefly um, touch upon, I already mentioned some of it, is the use of force through NATO. Article five of the NATO charter has been referred to by scholars as a three musketeers provision because Article five of NATO basically states that if a NATO member state is attacked, then all other NATO member countries will assist, have, have a duty to assist that attacked state militarily, including through the use of armed force. And as I mentioned earlier, in this instance, the problem with this is that Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So Article five of the NATO charter is not directly triggered. And there is a big difference here let me just pause and, and, and mention this. There's a big difference here, for example, between Ukraine and the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Some folks have said, well, aren't they next? And I would argue, no, they're not, because those three Baltic states are actually members of NATO. And so if Russia went after them and attacked them, this would then trigger Article 5 of the NATO Charter and would essentially invite a military response by other NATO countries. And as I already mentioned, though, there is precedent for NATO action on the territory of a non-member state, and these are the 1999 airstrikes against the former Yugoslavia. Now, the next relevant international law issue that I wanted to mention is international criminal accountability. As of today, we have a major international criminal court that's out there in The Hague in the Netherlands called the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over four different sets of crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression. The court has been around since 1998 when its Rome Statute was first negotiated and the court actually became operational in 2002. The International Criminal Court has already investigated war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine because a few years ago, Ukraine actually temporarily accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. There's a provision in the ICC statute which allows countries to do that. So the Ukraine already accepted jurisdiction of the court for war crimes, crimes against humanity and, and genocide. And the former ICC prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, in 2020 issued a, a, a conclusion where she concluded the preliminary investigation and she said how there's reasonable basis to believe that war crimes and crime of aggression have been committed in Ukraine. And the reason that Ukraine did this some years ago is in light of the um, occupation of Crimea by Russian forces and in light of Russian uh, military actions in the two breakaway, breakaway regions of Luhansk and Donetsk. The problem here though is that the ICC does not ha actually have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, which in this instance is probably the most relevant crime. 
And the reason that the ICC does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression is that the ICC Rome statute has a limited jurisdictional regime over the crime of aggression. So for the court to be, to be able to exercise jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, both the victim state and the aggressor state have to be members of the ICC. And in, th in this instance, Russia is not a member of the ICC. It's never going to become a member of the ICC. And so because of this limited jurisdictional regime of the court, the court will never be, be able to investigate the crime of aggression. And one important thing to remember here about the ICC is that the ICC is a court which actually imposes individual criminal responsibility on country leaders. So the ICC will prosecute a country president, a country prime minister, a military commander for their basically ordering um, the commission of some of these crimes. And so if the ICC's jurisdictional regime over the crime of aggression were less limited, then you might say, okay, well, someone like Putin someday could potentially face accountability in the ICC. But the problem here, as I mentioned, is that the crime of aggression for now requires both the victim country and the aggressor country to be members of the court. And here, Russia, by not being a member of the court, has essentially insulated itself from the reach of the court. I should mention that the United States is also not a member of the court. I don't have time to go into that right now, but there are reasons you know, essentially the United States also does not ever want its leaders or its military commanders to be exposed to the court's jurisdiction. And here I've, I've just included the definition of the crime of aggression simply to illustrate that it's actually crystal clear that Russia, President Putin has ordered for the act of aggression to be committed against Ukraine. Article 8 bis of the ICC statute defines the act of aggression as the use of armed force by a state against the so sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state. In this instance, it's crystal clear that Russia under President Putin has committed the act of aggression. But as I said earlier, as of now, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, simply does not have jurisdiction to prosecute Putin or any other Russian leader. Now, the other relevant international law issue that I wanted to mention here um, is international humanitarian law. These are all essentially subfields of international law. International humanitarian law, or the law of armed conflict, is the body of law that limits the conduct of states during warfare. Thus far, we have received credible reports, including photo evidence, that Russian forces have targeted civilian objectives, including, for example, civilian buildings. Under international humanitarian law, the intentional purposeful targeting of civilian objectives is a violation of international humanitarian law under both treaty law, treaty law such as, for example, the Geneva Conventions, but also under customary law, which, as I mentioned earlier, is binding on all states. Such a flagrant manifest violation of international humanitarian law gives rise to war crimes. As I mentioned in my previous slide, the International Criminal Court has already opened an investigation into Ukraine over prior Russian acts in Ukraine, and the ICC actually does have jurisdiction over war crimes. So Putin or other military or political Russian leaders could someday face accountability at the ICC over war crimes or crimes against humanity. So that is a, an accountability avenue that, that remains open. Now, I wanted to mention a few other international law issues that are, that are relevant, that are perhaps not as directly relevant as the, the prior two issues of use of force and individual criminal responsibility. But I wanted to mention these because this is actually part of Putin's discourse. Putin has been pretty savvy in terms of framing his arguments as to the validity of Russian invasion of Ukraine, he has tried to root his own arguments in international law. One of the issues here is self-determination. Self-determination is a fundamental principle of international law, which dictates that all peoples have the right to self-determine their political fate. And this goes back to um, President Woodrow Wilson, um, his famous speech at the end of um, World War I, President Woodrow Wilson talked about self-determination. And then during the decolonization period, self-determination was really the theoretical um, legal underpinning, if you will, for 
the quest for independence for all the different colonized peoples and countries. Um, and so the reason I mentioned this is that Putin has essentially hinted at the right to self-determination for the peoples of Donetsk, Luhansk, and also Crimea. I would argue that is, it is unclear that international law bestows upon non-colonized and non-oppressed peoples the right to exercise self-determination through remedial secession. So international law is clear that all peoples have a right to self-determination, but self-determination can also be exercised internally within the bounds within the territory of the existing parent states. And this, this type of um, internal exercise of self-determination essentially translates to an autonomy regime for the relevant people. International law does provide that colonized and oppressed and occupied peoples do have the right to exercise self-determination externally through remedial secession. And this really translates to that occupied, colonized, oppressed people separating from its parent state to form a, a new independent state. But in the context of non-colonized, non-occupied, non-oppressed peoples, international law does not say you have the right to go your, your, your own way and form an independent state. And again, we don't have time to go into this now, but think of, for example, um, Quebec, which tried to separate from Canada or had an independence uh, referendum in 1995. And the people of, of Quebec voted against that proposed separation. The Canadian Supreme Court a few years later issued an advisory opinion in which it clearly stated that non-colonized, non-oppressed peoples do not necessarily have a right to external self-determination. And the Canadian Supreme Court decided that the Quebecois rights to internal self-determination, autonomy within Canada were being fully respected. And then other examples that I could mention here include Catalonia, Kurdistan, the Kurds and Scotland, which have all had these these type of, if you will, secession referenda attempts to separate, to secede, but we've seen the international community's response, which is basically, no, you cannot do that so long as your rights within the parent state are being respected. The one outlier here would be the case of Kosovo, which actually um, was able to separate, secede from the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia following the 1999 NATO airstrikes. But I would put Kosovo as, as in, in a separate category because really it is a unique case and I would argue that even to this day, its status as a state in international law remains somewhat disputed. Kosovo is still not a member of the United Nations. And although it functions de facto independently, um, you know, there, there are some who would argue that it's still not a full-fledged state to this day. So I would really leave that case aside. But Putin has tried to claim that the peoples of Donetsk, Luhansk, Crimea have the right to self-determination, but absent evidence that Ukraine was oppressing these peoples was abusing their rights, it is inaccurate to argue that international law provides these peoples with the right to separate from Ukraine against the wishes of the Ukrainian leadership. And then a few other issues that I would touch upon are statehood and recognition. And these are also linked to this issue of, of self-determination. Putin has tried to essentially claim how Crimea, Luhansk, Donetsk, have the right to separate from Ukraine and, and has sort of hinted at statehood. Under international law, the so-called Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States, which goes back to 1934, um, defines a state as an entity that has a defined territory, permanent population, government, and the capacity to enter into international relations. As of now, I would argue that the Donetsk and, and Luhansk regions definitely do not have the capacity to enter inter international relations and that this you know, question of their statehood is truly premature. Um, another issue that I would mention is this issue of recognition. Some of you might remember that President Putin has actually officially recognized Luhansk and Donetsk. This was at the beginning, um, a few days before the, the military invasion of Ukraine. Um, under international law, one of the dominant views on recognition is that recognition is a political and sovereign act, and that states are allowed to recognize or not recognize emerging entities as states, and that that act of recognition really has no legal bearing on whether that entity satisfies the definition of statehood or not. Um, in the present instance, 
President Putin's act of recognition really has no legal bearing, no legal impact on the question of statehood for these territories. And, and, and same thing, we really don't have time in the context of this webinar to go into detail on this, but I really, I really wanted to just mention this because this is part of Putin's um, discourse. Um, and then one of the latest developments, this just happened um, yesterday, is that Ukraine has sued Russia in the International Court of Justice which is also located in The Hague in the Netherlands under the Genocide Convention. Now, what's the difference? Let me just pause here and explain the difference between the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and the International Court of Justice. Both are located in The Hague in the Netherlands because The Hague happens to be a major um, seat of international justice, if you will. But the big difference is that the International Criminal Court is a criminal court which prosecutes individuals country leaders, presidents, prime ministers, military commanders for genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is a basically a civil court where states can sue each other. The ICJ is part of the United Nations system. It's the judicial organ of the United Nations. And the way it works is that states can sue each other. However, jurisdiction here is voluntary. So states have to agree to litigate at the ICJ. And states can agree to litigate in the ICJ in two different ways. One is on an ad hoc basis. If they have a dispute, they can say, hey, let's go to the ICJ and allow the ICJ to settle the dispute. And another way is through a treaty. So there are some treaties that have dispute settlement provisions, which say basically for any dispute arising under this treaty, the ICJ shall have jurisdiction. One such treaty is the Genocide Convention. And so both Ukraine and Russia are members of the Genocide Convention. Ukraine has sued Russia in the ICJ under the Genocide Convention. The problem here is that this lawsuit, although it might be successful, in my opinion, will have limited effects on the actual conflict. And the reason for that is that, is that the ICJ has no direct enforcement mechanisms. And so the ICJ could, for example, issue a provisional order which orders Russia to get out of Ukraine, to stop using force in Ukraine. But if Russia chooses to disregard the ICJ's order, then the ICJ will have no way of enforcing that order. And then again, just to emphasize that the ICJ is not a criminal court and the ICJ cannot prosecute Putin or any other Russian leaders. And finally, because this lawsuit is brought under the Genocide Convention, because that's really the only way that the lawsuit could, could be brought at, as of this time, um, the ICJ will be limited in essentially only looking at genocidal acts. It won't be able to look at anything else. And so even if the ICJ ultimately rules against Russia, which it will, um, my prediction here is that this will really have a limited impact on the actual conflict. Um, and so, in conclusion, and then I see that there's some questions coming in so we can turn to your questions. It is abundantly clear that Russia has violated the international law prohibition on the use of force, but because of the veto structure of the UN Security Council, it is also very unlikely that, we'll, that we will see any collective use of force against Russia through the United Nations. The International Criminal Court remains limited in its ability to prosecute Putin or any other Russian leaders for the crime of aggression. As I mentioned earlier, the ICC could potentially prosecute Putin and other leaders for war crimes or crimes against humanity. And then, as I just mentioned, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, can issue a provisional ruling asking Russia to stop, but because the ICJ doesn't have any enforcement mechanisms, that ruling is likely to just remain ignored by the Russian leadership. And so just as a concluding thought, I would say that in this, in this conflict, in, in this instance, we clearly see the limits of international law vis-a-vis -vis a great power like Russia. International law does have these clear norms which prohibit this type of behavior, but because of its lack of ability to enforce um, uh, you know, ICJ rulings to um, order any kind of use of force against Russia through the United Nations Security Council, international law truly remains limited in, in, in how it can help to bring about the resolution of the conflict. So I will stop sharing my screen and I would invite 
associate dean whitmer rich to um turn to the questions okay excellent thank you for that uh really insightful uh introduction so i've got a series of questions here you're welcome to keep adding them to the queue um folks um so First question, is there any military consequence of Ukraine um, if they would join the EU, or is that separate from this, from, from what's going on here militarily? Yeah, militarily, I would say that there wouldn't be a direct consequence, right? There would be a direct consequence if Ukraine joined NATO, right? But if, jo if Ukraine joined the EU, this wouldn't have a direct military consequence. It would have sort of an indirect consequence in the sense that the EU has a common foreign policy, right? So now anything that happens to, to Ukraine would, would, would sort of be kicked in this bucket of the current foreign policy. And it, it you know, it, it potentially could change the calculus of EU states in terms of you know, do we want to go to NATO? Do do we want to use force now that one of our members has been attacked? So I would say, you know, there's a there's an indirect consequence, perhaps, but just joining the EU wouldn't necessarily trigger a direct military response. Excellent, thank you. Um, a question from Professor Decker Mida: Would you speak to why Ukraine is not already a member of NATO? Well, yeah, th this is this is part of essentially. Russia's red line, you know, back in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Russian leadership was clear in its message to NATO countries that NATO really could not expand east. Now, that, you know, eastward expansion has actually happened, as I mentioned um, earlier in my presentation, there's several uh, former Soviet bloc countries that have become members of NATO, including Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, the Czech Republic, and then also the Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, but Putin has, has clearly drawn a red line in terms of both Ukraine and Georgia. I should really mention Georgia, um, which is a former Soviet Republic, now an independent state in the Caucasus region. Putin has really drawn a red line in terms of those states joining NATO. Um, and so although Ukraine has sort of negotiated with NATO, um, you know, I, I think NATO countries are very cognizant of the fact that this really is, a, you know, a no-go for, for Russia. The other, the other reason I would say is that Ukrainian leadership has also changed. changed. So part of what triggered Putin's, uh, Putin's 2014 invasion in Crimea was precisely the fact that Ukrainian leadership had changed. Prior to that, Ukraine had a pro-Russian president, pro-Russian leadership. And we see this, this, for example, in the Belarus. Belarus is basically a Russian puppet state to a large extent, right? And so when the Ukrainian leadership changed, there was this, there were these massive protests in Ukraine, as some of you might remember, and a new pro-West, pro-European leader was elected. That's precisely what kicked Putin into action in 2014, among other reasons, to attack Crimea and to start backing these separatist regions. So the Crimean leadership up until 2014 because it was pro-Russian, really wasn't as interested in, in, in joining NATO. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hoffman asks, uh, could you comment on the extent to which international humanitarian law prohibits Russia from engaging in violence that impacts health care in the Ukraine, specifically uh, attacking hospitals, health care workers, um, anybody else engaged in efforts to protect the health care of the population? Yeah, that's a great question. And so that question goes to what I talked about, you know, a little bit earlier, and that is that international humanitarian law clearly prohibits intentional attacks against civilian objectives. And a hospital would, would certainly be a civilian objective unless that hospital were being used by the military for some military purpose. But if a hospital is being used for its primary purpose, which is to treat patients, then it remains a civilian objective. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but is that true even if it's being used as a military hospital to treat, you know, it's not being used as a, an occasion to track attack, uh, you know, the Russians, but it's being used just for just to treat military uh, personnel who've been injured. Yeah, so long as, you know, the, the only the only way that the calculus changes is that this becomes a legitimate military objective is that there are attacks being launched from the mm -hmm. hospital, right? So at that point, the hospital would become a legitimate military target. But if it's just being used to treat folks, they, they could be military or civilian, it's not a legitimate target. And actually, I do have to mention that the United States has been accused, and the United States actually did this in 2015, the United States launched an attack against this a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I don't want to go into that. That's not really the 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 focus of this of this discussion. 
But the United States itself, you know, has done this where it has clearly committed, in my opinion, a violation of international humanitarian law by targeting the hospital. But to go back to Professor Hoffman's question, attacking hospitals is a clear violation of the principle of distinction under international humanitarian law. And because it's such a manifest violation, it gives rise to a war crime. And then what follows from that is that military commanders, leaders who ordered these attacks could face individual criminal responsibility for war crimes at a future tribunal. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question, the ruble has dropped approximately 30% in value today due to Western sanctions. Um, in what way is that likely to modify Putin's decision-making going forward? Are these economic sanctions, which I think we're seeing in a, in a way that are much more powerful than what we've seen in the past. Um, is this, do you think this is gonna really affect what happens here? Yeah, so unfortunately, you no know, sanctions are really controversial as is. There are lots of folks who are against sanctions in general because they say that ultimately sanctions really hurt people on the ground, right? So even if you're trying to deter the political or military leadership in a country from doing X, Y, and Z, you end up really hurting the people of that country who may not even support the leader. And, you know, and the leaders could be still sitting in their palaces, you know, drinking champagne, right? It's not really hurting that. Um, in this particular, so and the other tricky part here is that. When we talk about sanctions, there's a wide variety of sanctions you can think about. And so the first level of sanctions that was imposed against Russia only targeted smaller financial institutions, so not the big Russian banks, but really the, the smaller ones, and targeted you know, a number of Russian oligarchs, Russian millionaires and billionaires. Some people say, well, that's just not enough. What you have to do is you have to do sanctions on a much larger scale that are actually going to hurt Russia if you actually want to deter Putin. There are a couple of problems with it. One, because Russia is such a superpower, any Western country that imposes such large scale sanctions against Russia is going to end up hurting its own economy as well. And many country leaders are just not willing to go there, right? So for example, we saw that Germany, one of the things that Germany did is that it withdraw the permission to start using this gas pipeline, which was going to deliver natural gas from Russia to Germany and other European states under the Baltic Sea. So Germany withdrew its approval for that, but that's now going to hurt Germany and presumably other European nations because they rely on <clears throat> Russian gas, right? So that's, you know, that, that's, that's a big problem. And then the other thing is that Russia, Putin, um, over the last several years has sort of prepared for this. Apparently Russia has a large number of reserves, like lots of money sitting around. So they're well positioned to essentially absorb the effect of these sanctions, you know, that's one issue. And then the other issue is that Russia, Putin in, in preparing for this has really turned to China and has enhanced the trade with China. China as of now is not sanctioning Putin. And so Russia seems to be in a pretty good position. Now the, the sanctions are intensifying, right? So at some point we might reach a stage where Putin's bankers essentially said to him, you have to stop, you know, this is this is too much, right? And part of that, for example, I don't know if you saw this, but um, uh, banning Russia from the SWIFT banking system, which is this um, online bank messaging system, you know, th that that could have a large effect. But, but sanctioning countries are gonna have to reach the stage where like, well, we're willing to hurt our own economies to go with these larger scale sanctions, Otherwise, I think if we're just talking about smaller, smaller, smaller um, tranche of sanctions, that I don't think it's going to work. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question: Does Putin's argument about self-determination uh, fall down because of the Republic of Chechnya? In other words, his, his reaction to the Republic of Chechnya isn't that kind of maybe inconsistent with the claims he's making now? Yeah, absolutely. And I see that was a question from Professor Nelson, who's a professor in the poli sci department. Thank you for the question. Um, absolutely. You know, Putin has been very savvy in terms of, you know, coming up with these international arguments. He's not just standing up and saying, well, I'm just doing this because I can. He's actually trying to use international law to justify his claims. But his arguments about self-determination, which I said is this principle that peoples ought to be able to self-determine their political fate, really fall on their face because some of our audience mem mem members might remember that there were these independence movements in Chechnya, Chechnya that were basically quashed down by Russia. And that is actually when Putin came to power. Putin came to power as someone who was, you know, he was in charge of all of this. He basically put down the Chechen. Chechen. So it's very hard to claim that the people of Donetsk and Luhansk have the right to solve determinations, but Chechens do not. So, you know, you're absolutely right to point this out. Excellent. The next question is pretty technical and I'm not going to even be able to pronounce it, right? When you say article XX, what is it, BIS, B-I-S? Article A BIS, yeah. So what is that? So that's because, so article A BIS of the ICC statute 
is the article that has the definition of aggression, the crime of aggression, and the prohibition of the crime of aggression. And the reason that the ICC drafters, the statute drafters went with this, which is like a B in a sense, right, is because the crime of aggression was added later to the Rome Statute of the ICC. The Rome Statute was negotiated in 1998. The court became operational in 2002. And it wasn't until 2010 at the so-called review conference of the ICC, which took place in Kampala, Uganda, that's when ICC member states basically negotiated this new article on aggression. And the reason for that is that aggression is probably the most controversial crime within the statute of the ICC, because you know most countries, when they engage in aggressive military behavior claim self-defense, right? So that line between defense and, and aggression can sometimes be tricky. And so the crime of aggression was added in 2010. It wasn't activated until 2017. And so because it's this sort of like extra article in the Rome statute, it became article eight bis because there already was an article eight and there already was an article nine, right? So they kind of inserted aggression between eight and nine. Excellent, thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, why didn't Ukraine file their lawsuit uh, against in the, in the jurisdiction of the ICC instead of the ICJ so that Putin himself can be prosecuted? I think you answered this, but, um, but go ahead and clarify. Yeah, so these are two different courts. The ICC is the International Criminal Court. It can prosecute individuals for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and now the crime of aggression. As I indicated earlier, the jurisdictional regime is much more limited for the crime of aggression. So right now, the ICC does have jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes in Ukraine, but it does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So why did Ukraine go to the ICJ? Well, that's just another um, lawfare vehicle, if you will. I don't know if you've heard this term lawfare, the use of law to essentially advance your own you know, causes. Um, and so rightly so, Ukraine is using all sorts of um, legal avenues that it has. And so in addition to the ICC being able to investigate genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, Ukraine decided to also go to the ICJ to sue Russia to try to trigger state responsibility, right? In, in this in this interstate, you know, organ that settles disputes between states. Excellent, thank you. Um, would there be legal? Another question: Would there be legal authority for Belarus to join Russia um, in its actions in Ukraine? What what about the role of Belarus here? Well, the only way that Belarus could legally, under international law, join Russia is if Russia could somehow claim self-defense against Ukraine. So if Ukraine had attacked Russia, then any state could join Russia um, under this bucket of what we call collective self-defense. But in this particular instance, that is really not the case. It's Russia that's the aggressor and it's Ukraine that has to self-defense. So Belarus could actually legally under international law join Ukraine in self-defense against Russia, but you can't legally under international law join an aggressor state and say, we're, 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 we're joining forces together. And you know, if, if, you think, if, if, you, if you think about it for a second, you know, it really doesn't make sense to say any state should be authorized to join the aggressor um, you know, under international law that's legal. That, that's not how it works. Uh, excellent. Turns out that's how it works under regular self-defense law too, right? You can't you can't help out an aggressor in a, exactly. in a fight. Um, you can join to defend someone else. Um, okay, so here's an interesting question. Do you anticipate that individual actors within the Russian military could perhaps be tried by states like Belgium or Germany um, through those states exercising extraterritorial jurisdiction over war crimes? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I actually forgot to mention this in my presentation. So thank you for the question. Another accountability option, if you want to go after someone like Putin or some, some other Russian military leaders, is that some states have what's called universal jurisdiction statutes. Statutes. Universal jurisdiction is the ability of any state to prosecute individuals guilty of heinous atrocity crimes, such as, for example, genocide, war crimes, torture, crimes against humanity. So some states have these universal jurisdiction statutes which allow for this type of prosecution. And I would mention here a very recent example of this. There's a German court which just recently prosecuted two Syrian officials for acts of torture committed in Syria under the German universal jurisdiction statute. So this actually is a possibility. And if I were Putin or any other Russian military leader, I would not be traveling to Germany or any other country that has universal jurisdiction anytime soon. So the limitation there is really just um, if one of the countries would 
physically be able to get their hands on one of these uh, suspects. That's what happened in the Syrian uh, well, yeah. uh, defendants, correct? In the Syrian case, what happened is that these two individuals were actually physically present in Germany. Right. One of them or both of them had actually applied for asylum in Germany and were actually you know, admitted to Germany because you know, if you think about it, there were sure. hundreds of thousands of people trying to get asylum. And at that time, German authorities didn't really know who they were. So once the case was you know, initiated through victims groups and um, all sorts of sort of advocacy around this, the fact that they were in Germany facilitated their apprehension. Now, a country could still have a trial in absentia, right? You could still sure. try somebody under universal jurisdiction in absentia, but that obviously would have limited effects. Excellent. Um, another question, Does do NATO countries have to have defined borders? In other words, Russians, Russia's presence in Crimea, does that, is that part of what complicates complicated Ukraine potentially joining NATO, or is it really independent? They could have joined NATO even if there was this kind of border dispute happening with Russia at the time. Yeah, I don't think that border disputes necessarily prevent or like an are an obstacle in terms of countries joining NATO. You know, and if you think about it, there are lots of places where we have disputed territory, right, and the borders are not so well defined. So that's not in and of itself, uh, you know, an obstacle. An obstacle here is more, you know, for Ukraine and and and, and Georgia, um, the Russian leadership really had drawn a red line, you know, back in the '90s and said, no way to NATO countries, you know, you're you're not going here. Thank you. Uh, a comment from Amy Birchfield or a question. Can you comment on the various sanctions that are being imposed on Russia and the issue with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which you mentioned a little bit earlier? I, I did hear, uh, I don't know if you've heard this, that um, while on the one hand, some Western countries are imposing certain financial sanctions and uh, limiting certain financial transactions with Russia, I believe that they are still permitting themselves to buy energy, gas and oil from yeah. Russia, because that's such an important part of their own yeah. economies. Is that is am I correct about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that goes to what I said earlier about the same basically countries being willing to sanction Russia so heavily in a way that would hurt their own economy. Right. And, and that's why I think we see so many countries that are imposing sanctions, but in, in a much more limited way. And so Amy is asking about this gas pipeline. I think I already mentioned this, you know, is this gas pipeline that goes from Russia under the Baltic Sea into Germany? Um, delivers natural gas. Because, you know, when you think of like oil and gas, oil can be transported a lot more easily than gas. For gas, you actually need pipelines. Um, there are is procedures- this, now Is this an existing pipeline or a proposed pipeline that they well, would on there? It's an existing pipeline, but basically it's a new pipeline. And so Germany was in the process of delivering approvals for I the see. pipeline. And but for this invasion of Ukraine, the permissions would have been there, right? Because Right. Most of Europe actually relies on, on this natural yes. gas heating and all sorts of things. Now there are, I should mention that apparently there are processes where you can liquefy the natural gas and deliver it that way, but that's a lot more expensive and a lot more complex. So we're kind of st stuck with the, with the pipelines. So Germany has proved itself very willing, if you will, to go this extra step of sanctioning Russia through withdrawing its approval for this pipeline, which will then halt the delivery of the natural gas and it will, um, cause a rise in prices, if you will, in, in Europe. So that, that is a huge step, you know. Um, and then so the question is like sort of how much does it hurt Europe versus how much does it hurt Russia? Is it enough to deter Putin? Um, another question from uh, Steve Ligersky. What can we do to help here locally? Is there a church where we can donate money, some other place to donate money? Yeah, I, I'm sure, you know, there's a, there's, there's a large Ukrainian community here in Cleveland. Unfortunately, I don't have that information at my fingertips, but I'm sure that there is a way to, to, to help locally. So I would just, you know, Google it or, or contact the Ukrainian church or, you know, tr try, to, try to find a contact within the Ukrainian community. Excellent. And I think that you had um, mentioned, I wanted to prompt that you're part of an organization that put together some... Um, a, a website which has just gone live with some legal resources. Could, could you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yes. So um, I'm part of a, a, a group of academics, other experts, who've been working with this organization called the Public International Law and Policy Group, which is a major NGO located in Washington, D.C., but that really has like global operations. And we just launched today at 10 o'clock in the morning, so just a couple of hours ago, we launched a website which is basically... Um, a website containing all sorts of information in terms of human rights documentation. If you're somebody who wants to document abuses committed by Russian forces in, your, in, in Ukraine, we have resources for you in terms of how to do that. 
We also have resources regarding the various accountability mechanisms. So, you know, if, if you are a state and you're thinking about using universal jurisdiction to prosecute Putin, you know, here, here's, here's to go. So just a website that has mostly legal resources, not, not, not really humanitarian resources, but legal resources. But there are other organizations out there that are more focused on the, on the humanitarian aspect. Okay, great. I'll try to provide that website here if I can figure out how to do it. But while we're um, while I'm doing that, um, uh, one of our students, Jason Sayuda, asks, "What do you believe is Putin's end game?" Um, I've read that U.S. intelligence believes that it's regime regime change in Ukraine and the placement of a pro-Russia head of state in Ukraine. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, totally. I think you're absolutely right, Jason. That is the end game. You know, again, think of Belarus. Belarus has this very like pro-Russian leadership. The end game is Putin is going to invade. He's going to, you know, there are actually peace talks happening as we speak, right? So we might be, you know, missing crucial updates here, but you know, there are peace peace talks happening actually in Belarus right now. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, who knows? But I think the ultimate end game for Putin is to topple the current. Ukrainian leadership and to install a pro-Russian leadership and then say, oh, but Ukraine is an independent state. Look, I've, I've withdrawn, you know, but but to essentially install someone who he can control. Excellent. Um, OK, uh, a question from uh, Gregory Glein. What is the likelihood that NATO would consider granting emergency membership status to Ukraine? Is that even an option? And if uh, such membership status were to be granted now, would there need to be additional transgression to trigger an Article Five violation, or would the ongoing conflict kind of already do that? Yeah. So first of all, let me let me ask, answer that in the reverse order. So yeah, the current violations would definitely trigger Article Five already. This this is enough. You know, if this isn't enough, then you can ask yourself like, what else? You know. So definitely, Article Five would be triggered. But I think that the prospects of Ukraine joining NATO are really slim because, as I said earlier, um, because of the Russian. Uh, military power, you know, the, the U.S. has the largest military, but Russia is really second, right? So the Russian military is, is, is huge. No NATO country is particularly excited about the prospect of going to war against Russia. Even if all other European states and the United States combined their forces, it would still be a major war and it could be a nuclear war, right? Think about that. So because of that, where we are right now, I think basically there's no chance of Ukraine um, becoming a member of NATO. It would really be a decision to go to for the the NATO powers uh, to go to war with Russia. And that's a decision that so far they haven't, um, you know, been willing to make. And so joining NATO sort of would just almost be symbolic, right? It would be the question of, are they gonna go to war with Russia? And, and yeah, and if you think about it, this is precisely why Putin didn't want Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, right? Because he was very, very well aware that, um, you know, if he were to go after the Baltic states, that would trigger article five of NATO, right? But if he goes after Ukraine or Georgia, you know, if I were Georgia, I'd be very scared. If, if he goes after them, they're not NATO members. It doesn't trigger Article 5. It doesn't trigger, a, a, you know, a, a full-blown war. So he's very well aware of that. But but NATO countries are as well. So so right now, unfortunately, I don't think there's a chance of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. Uh, another student, Isaac Blake, asks, can you speak of or are you aware of any... Um, efforts to document war crime and human rights violations happening now in Ukraine? Yeah, so so first of all, this website that um, I think, uh, I think you, well, I, I, we'll, 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 we, can, we can figure out a way to provide a link if we can't do it in the chat. But um, this, this website that I just talked about actually has resources about how to do human rights documentation. But I am up until now, um, I am aware of some efforts in Ukraine to document. So I was actually um, on behalf of this organization that I already mentioned, the Public International Law and Policy Group, um, I was a part of a team of experts. We actually worked with the Ukrainian government to help them set up a documentation center. Now, as you can imagine, that center is definitely on hold right now. But over the last, I would say, sort of eight to nine months, I know for a fact that the Ukrainian government was looking into setting up a documentation center, and that center would have started to document violations that had already taken place in Ukraine starting in 2014 with respect to Crimea and then with respect to the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. So there, there already are efforts, but it's, it's fair to assume that those efforts are now halted. Got it. Um, here's an interesting question that I don't even know what we're being referred to here, but uh, how does the Budapest Memorandum come into play in the current situation? What is the Budapest Memorandum? Yeah, um, the Budapest Memorandum is a memorandum that was signed in 1994 between Ukraine, the US, the UK, and Russia. 
And through that memorandum, Ukraine actually became a member of the so-called Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and agreed to give up its arsenal of nuclear weapons. And this actually goes back to the former Soviet Union. You know, the former, so former Soviet Union was a nuclear state, a declared nuclear state, but some of the nuclear weapons were actually located in Ukraine because Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union. And so in 1994, the US, the UK, Russia negotiated with Ukraine and said, we want you to become a member of this non-proliferation treaty. And if you're a member of the non-proliferation treaty, by the way, you agree to not proliferate nuclear weapons. And you also agree that if you're not a declared nuclear state, you're not gonna become one, right? And Ukraine had not been a declared nuclear state, right? Because it was a part of the Soviet Union. But as a result of that uh, agreement by the Ukrainian authorities to give up this arsenal of nuclear weapons, the US, UK, and Russia agreed to guarantee the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So I'm glad you're mentioning this because Putin, Russia, is actually also in direct violation of the Budapest Agreement. And you might argue that the US and the UK actually have a duty to go help Ukraine, right? Because presumably if Ukraine hadn't given up its nuclear weapons, it would be in a very different position right now vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Very interesting. Um, Professor Falk asks, are cyber attacks on power grids recognized as a form of warfare under international law? Is that a, is that a form of kind of armed conflict? Yeah, there has been a lot of scholarship recently actually in this area, because this is really a developing area of the law. And there are scholars out there who have made the argument how cyber attacks can actually constitute an act of aggression. You know, traditionally aggression means you're sending the military across the border and you're invading, you know, what Putin yeah, is doing. Some physical but intrusion. Physical, exactly. But there's increasing, there, you know, there's this increasing awareness that cyber attacks can be just as powerful, just as disruptive, and that cyber attacks can also threaten the political independence, territorial integrity of a state. And so I would answer Professor Falk by saying that, yes, there's definitely a developing body of scholarship which argues in this direction that cyber attacks can constitute attacks, can constitute aggression, can maybe not war crimes, but definitely can constitute attacks for the purposes of aggression. Thank you. Uh Another student, uh, Chance Zarub, asking, what are the implications of other states uh, sending their own troops to the Ukraine or even military or monetary aid? He's asking about non-NATO countries, but it could be NATO countries as well. I mean, Ukraine's not a member of NATO. So what are the implications of that? Yeah, so, that, you know, thanks, Chance, for that question. Um, this is precisely the game that most of the international community is playing. Most countries are unwilling to say, we're going to send troops to Ukraine and we're going to fight Russian forces on the ground. But many states by now have proven themselves, themselves, themselves willing to send military and monetary aid to Ukraine. And I would say that under international law, because we're talking about this paradigm of collective self-defense, right? I would argue that all of these actions are legal under international law. The countries, when they do this, they're not violating international law. I would also mention, I don't know if you saw this, but the Ukrainian president Zelensky, who I think has been formidable, truly formidable over the last few days, um, he has actually openly on social media asked for foreign mercenaries to come fight in Ukraine. Now, I don't, I do have to pause there because mercenaries have a really bad track record across the globe. And so I kind of, you know, I, I can't help but cringe at that, you know, but but at the same time, from his perspective, I understand, you know, what, what he's doing. Very interesting. Um, another question, do you foresee international legal implications regarding um, non-Ukrainian refugees fleeing the conflict? So say, for example, foreign students or other non-Ukrainian folks um, trying to free flee the conflict and being denied entry at uh, neighboring borders like Poland, um, uh, what do you think about folks who are not Ukrainian citizens trying to flee uh, Ukraine right now? Yeah, so, you know, U Ukraine, um, some of you might have seen this, Ukraine right now passed this, you know, martial law, if you will, so that Ukrainian citizens, the women and the children are allowed to leave, but the men are not allowed to leave. But that, you know, prohibition on, on, on men from leaving does not apply to foreign citizens, right? So, so non-Ukrainians can leave. The question then becomes, where do they go? You know, under international law, countries are actually allowed to intervene on a smaller scale scale in the territory of another state to protect their own nationals. So like another country, for example, could launch like a small scale operation in, in Ukraine, for example, to rescue its own nationals from Ukraine, right? But I think what this question gets at also is, 
um, asylum, right? Like do, do other countries have a duty to accept asylum seekers? And unfortunately the answer is not really, right? And, and we really saw that in the context of Syria where many countries have proven themselves unwilling to accept large, large numbers of, of, of Syrian refugees. Here, Poland seems to have essentially opened its border. Poland seems to be receiving uh, many, I guess, Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians non um, in, into Poland. But there isn't a clear duty on behalf of states to accept asylum seekers. Okay, excellent. Um, there are a few folks, uh, well, we, we are really out of time. There are a few folks who have in the Q&A um, said some things about uh, donations. Um, Market Garden Restaurant and Bar Brewery is donating all of their sale proceeds this week to uh, Ukraine. There's a, uh, a news um, story about that. So that, that's, you know, that's a great idea. Um, there are, of course, other uh, questions, but we're out of time. And so I think I'm going to wrap it up. I would like to really thank uh, Professor Stereo uh, for a really insightful presentation, not only the presentation, but a very long Q&A period where I feel like we were playing um, stump Professor Stereo about international <laughs> law and we failed. Uh, so uh, thank you for all those really excellent and insightful answers. And thank you all for uh, attending. Stay tuned for other um, upcoming uh, events and uh, everyone have a, a good and safe day. Thank you.